any kind of designer, you want your craft to be crafted and you want to have it be high quality and you want it to have some kind of permanence. But the rate of change of, of a lot of companies we work with is just so fast. It's almost like that's not the same value system anymore. Hi, everyone. I'm Jamie Derringer. I'm Amy Devers, and this is Clever. And today we're talking to David Schwartz. He's co-founder of Hush Studios. And Hush Studios is known for, among other things, harmonizing digital technology and physical space to create stunning, interactive, experiential design for big deal clients like Instagram, Google, Capital One, Nike. Before founding Hush Studios, David honed his craft at an interactive design startup during the first dot-com boom in San Francisco and an MFA in media design from Art Center. Some solid and fruitful years as a freelancer linked him up with his creative partner in Hush and prepared him for leadership. Let's get the story from David. I'm David Schwarz. I'm the co-founder of Hush. We're in Brooklyn, New York, and we're an experienced design firm. Uh, and we blend architectural space and digital technology to create installations and experiences that people can inhabit, learn from, play in, and feel things inside of. Oh, it's such a cool job. And why do you think you're motivated to do that? <laughs> what, what's compelling you? I mean, I've always been very sensitive, literally, uh, you know, attuned to senses and kind of how things make you feel. And I think experience design, it's a difficult word. It means a lot of different things to different people. But just the kind of core idea that as designers, we have control over all these different layers and elements in, in our environment, some physical, some digital, some hitting the other senses, some oral, that on their own, do very interesting things uh, and have, you know, industries been built around them on their own. But when you put them together, it's this kind of complex sandwich, sometimes better, sometimes worse, that really needs a kind of guiding hand to have the space uh, deliver a kind of experience that you want. So it's, it's like a really complex intersection of a lot of my personal interests and, and of course, of the interests and skills of, of our team, you know, who all look at the same challenge through sort of different lenses. Well, thank you for that in-depth explanation. And it is a, a layered sandwich. We're glad that it's in such good hands or else that sandwich can be really not very savory. <laughs> but before, before we get into the depth and complexity of your work, we really want to understand how you arrived at this like we like to go all the way back to the beginning so can you talk about your childhood for us like where you grew up what your family was like any kind of stories from your youth that would illustrate what kind of kid you were absolutely and and guys i listened to a lot of the my favorite people uh, on previous versions of this so kudos to you guys on collecting really really interesting folks and having great dialogue so i kind of heard how you went back to zero with a lot of people which by the way is a sort of I'm a very future kind of focused person. I don't spend a lot mm -hmm. of time thinking about the past. You know, I, I don't spend, I just don't spend a lot of time in the past. It's just kind of like a funny thing. I'm like, I forget about great things we've done very quickly. And I'm like, on to the next thing. It's like always about the next, which I think is healthy in some ways and destructive in others probably. But yeah, like going back, I grew up in New Jersey, about an hour and a half from the city. At the time, it was more kind of rural or, or kind of country than it is now. Obviously, there's been more development and it's more kind of suburbs now. But I spent a lot of time outside and by myself. And I was an only child, you know, seeking out weird things to explore and make and build. So I had a lot of like autonomy mm -hmm. and kind of freedom, which is something I kind of feel bad about because I have two young kids, nine and five. And you know, living in Brooklyn is a whole different experience for them in terms of their sphere of control and their, their white space and how much area they have to just be free and autonomous. I had quite a bit. It was very open. What kinds of interesting things did you seek out to make and build and explore? I mean, I made everything from, you know, remote control cars to weird 
structures out of sticks and twine to tree houses to model airplanes to strange like engineering technical mechanical gear things that did nothing but were fun to put together i would tear apart you know old technology and play with the circuit boards my dad told me how to solder when i was young and i would solder random pieces of metal together for no reason um <laughs> You know, I had like a, That's the best. yeah, like, you know, normal stuff. It was kind of like that. That was like very micro, you know, very working with your hands and, you know, stuff that would happen on a tabletop or a basement somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there was also the outdoors thing. I spent a lot of time in the woods, you know, walking around, uh, hanging out, throwing rocks, you know, falling into streams, you know, hurting myself, those kinds of things that I think is also a different kind of creation or exploration you know well both of them give you a certain kind of confidence in the physical world i think yeah and a connection between the brains and the hands and what they're able to do and how they're able to manipulate materials and you know physics in order to ensure your survival or build something new yeah were your parents supportive of all this exploration were they tuned out and doing their own thing what was that like they were very supportive tuned out is not how i'd describe them um tuned in is how i would describe them Um, oh cool uh, wonderful supportive parents um but very tuned in you know and that that can be taken to an extreme as well (laughs) but you know i think tuned tuned into the way that, that if they saw me enjoying something they would try to offer more space to do that right so It wasn't directed. It was just supported in the directions I was going. I mean, my dad ran a company that was like a manufacturing company and he was an engineer by trade. So he had this like engineer brain, pretty rational, binary, mathematics, German background, precision, efficiency, form, you know, electricity Mm -hmm. works or doesn't. Right. So it's like binary kind of uh, practice. Yes, And then my mom was a teacher and then stay at home, but she was very artistic, very kind of free, free minded in the sense that it it was almost the polar opposite. So I was able to sort of draw from those two personalities, I guess, in in, in interesting ways. Yeah, you had both the right brain and the left brain. Yes. uh, Encouraging you along. That's awesome. It was great. What it gives you is a liberal arts (laughs) education. You can't go anywhere else if you have both brains sort of on uh, pumping at the same time. And that might, you know, explain some of the decisions I made after that. But it was interesting because I felt both of those things were very pleasurable to me. I didn't have a like a truly artist mind where I could focus mm. on something or there was something inside of me that had to come out. I was often very responsive to what was out there, almost like um, taking in the world and then kind of producing something from it. it. It didn't feel like it was boiling over inside of me and like things I had to say to the world and stances I had to take. So that was uh, something I definitely noticed. And, and in retrospect, I, I see as different than a lot of folks I work with today. But I had a mind that was like very meticulous and driven. And um, I liked putting things together that had a start and a finish you know, even if they were quite complex. So this kind of like ability to say, I started, I worked hard and I did this thing was very important. I'm curious how you functioned in school. Did you have a traditional like public school upbringing? I mean, education and like, did you follow the rules okay? Or were you kind of always wondering why things were done the way they were done and seeing how you could make them better? That's a great question. It was public school to private high school, pretty much. And I would say I I always did well in school. I don't know if that was generated by a desire to please, you know, only Mm. only child tuned in parents desire to desire to please is an unknown but high quality in that environment. So I think I had that. Although there's a difference between a desire to please that feels external like pleasing a teacher or pleasing a parent or a a counselor or something. But I thought the desire to do well and like accomplish things that came kind of from within, you know? Yeah. It's different from the pursuit of excellence. The desire to please is more like I need some validation and excellence kind of comes from an internal driver. Yeah. I don't want to say I didn't have both, you know, I I think I was, Mm -hmm. I I can think of many times where I I thought I did something really well and the innate feeling of doing something well was there, but it was, 
it was also supported by knowing that, you know, important people in my life would also see it and feel good about it, you know? So there's a validation, which by the way, continues today, which we can get to later. Uh, <laughs> that has not, yes. that has not gone away. Let's. And so I, I, I think both of those things are okay. I think as long as there's this sort of internal drive at the core, it's okay if you want other people to see it and notice it. I think that's just human nature. I feel like my problem was I would do things well and I would kind of know internally I had done them well, even though they weren't according to the rules. And then I'd get really conflicting advice from the people I wanted to please. When I was thinking like, yay, isn't this great? I did it better than you guys do it. <laughs> and they were like, no, you didn't follow the rules. Right. You were the one who was challenging the rules of the game, not just the yeah. output. Yeah. I have a very similar experience. I kind of was always trying to outsmart the man <laughs> or outsmart the game mm -hmm, or outsmart mm -hmm. the teacher or something. <laughs> it, you know, and it wasn't that I was like there to shake everything up or a, a particularly rebellious kid. But I kind of always saw the system that I was in, you know, like, right. why are yeah. we doing it this way? Oh, because this is how you're judged. This is how it's graded. This is this is the curricula. And you're like, well, it doesn't make any sense. You know, I'll work hard, but tell me I'm going to work hard within a structure that makes sense, uh, you know. So speaking of challenging authority, were you like that as a teenager? And did you take it further? Were you angsty? What were you like? Oh, I was pretty good. I wish I had some like amazing rebellious story. It's it's all there. I mean, I wrecked <laughs> the house, I wrecked the car, I did the thing, I got the <laughs> tattoo. I you know, like whatever. But it wasn't ever coming from a place where I was like trying to burn the world, you know? I was I think I was pretty contained uh, in 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 the whole scheme of things, you know? I think I was just testing boundaries and seeing what was okay and what wasn't and I think Actually, I probably rebelled and found my voice much later than most people. And which I think is nice to, to know that constantly able to redefine yourself and, and find what you love. And mm -hmm. I remember feeling like tons of pressure when I was younger to like find that thing that I loved. And I just loved so much stuff, you know, and I, I was like, oh, God, I think I had a guidance counselor in high school tell me like, I'm screwed. <laughs> like, like literally I'm screwed or even like to the point of like actually telling my parents that I was, it could like really inhibit my success or something. Because you were like all over the place. Like I threw pottery, you know, all through high school and was like entering pots and like and ceramics and like art competitions. And I, and then I was like studying like German and I was like played tons of sports and you know, it was like, I wasn't, a great typecast fit for like a kid who wants to go to college and, you know, study this and be successful. I was just, I was like a scatter of data. I didn't have like a nice, simple, clean story, which I think is basically what. There was know, no pattern advice. emerging. There was no pattern. It was like buckshot. I just like everything. <laughs> but that's a pattern. <laughs> it's a pattern. Yeah. Random, <laughs> randomness. Well, yeah. it's, speaking of it's, random, how did you end up studying economics? I think what's interesting is like, I was such a product of like my surroundings and my time. And this was like, so I was, you know, in high school in the early nineties. So what was around me in my, for uh, context, when did you graduate? I graduated high school in 95. Okay. And it was like, you know, middle class, upper middle class, suburban New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So there was plenty of angst to find, but you know, you had to, the angst was there. Uh, but it was also covered by like a lot of doctors and teachers and lawyers and finance people commuting into the city and like people who are just kind of like living the suburban life. I had these like things I was doing and I didn't know that they were careers. Or I didn't know you could do it. The only thing I knew that I thought I could do and I thought I wanted to do, I just didn't know exactly how to get there, was architecture, which I never did. But I thought I wanted to do it. And that's something from an early age, I was building houses and structures and things all day. And maybe, you know, in high school and college, I was doing some like shallow uh, study of architectural history and drafting and those kinds of things. That was a through line. But other than that, I think my experience is like what I could do with all these divergent skills I had wasn't very clear. And it was like a totally an exposure thing. 
no one told me that design was a practice. Mm. This is something we hear over and over and over again, and I am hell-bent on changing that because I feel like if I had known that that was something I could study in school, it would have changed everything from elementary school all the way through high school. I would have had something to work toward, to aspire to, to look into, to research, to think about. I just didn't know. To know that there's a whole legacy and history and context there to tap into of people who are like thinking like you're thinking would have been amazing. I mean, I have no regrets. Mm -hmm. And I actually think my shallow curve of of getting to where I wanted to be or the, the slow kind of model benefited me in ways I can't even comprehend. Things would have been way different if I had found my sort of love earlier, if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. It does make sense because because you didn't know what your direction was. You just almost in a desperate effort to find what you were good at, you gave yourself permission to explore so many things. And then you got this real tapestry of interests and skills to sort of work from later in life when you did start to point your all your skills in a certain direction. Yeah. And to get back to your question that precipitated this piece, economics seemed like a thing that was familiar to people that I knew, like finance and money people and this kind of like, you know, New York City thing. And it was like, it has to be beneficial in some way, right? Like no matter what I do, like it would be good to understand like how businesses work and how economies work and and that. For Um, sure. It turns out I was so bad at it. (laughs) Like, I was a pretty good student, like, my entire life. I struggled so much in this major. It should have been absolutely clear um, why I wasn't into it or what my DNA wasn't, wasn't made for that. But I think it was like a hedge or like an insurance plan or something like that. I don't know. It wasn't very well thought out. But the, the thing you don't see is that, like, I figured out that. I figured out what I needed to do. And I sort of, like, accelerated into it and just figured out how to get decent grades and get economics kind of out of the way. And I got it out of the way like very early in my, uh, the major credits early in, in school. And so I just did everything else I loved from then on. I went back to pottery. I did tons of art history, architectural history. I was doing, you know, portraiture and free drawing and sculpture. And basically my last year and a half at school was just like dedicated to these things that I had such a a more of an an innate love for that just came from like the feeling. Um, It was easier to do and it was more gratifying. So that tells you a lot. Yeah, it does. And I'm, I'm wondering, are you like that in real life too, in every day? Like, do you get the unpleasant stuff out of the way first and then spend the rest of the day enjoying the stuff that you like, the fun to do? That sounds amazing. (laughs) <laughs> but it doesn't work like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you sort of got econ under your belt almost just to do it and get through and still managed to get an education and a bunch of things that you really enjoyed. And then you went to San Francisco and worked for an interactive studio. I need to know all about that and what you were doing there and also how that shaped you as a as a creative and as a young like wide-eyed boy. (laughs) Yeah, which I was in a lot of ways. (laughs) So at the end of school, I got into this program at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, and it was like a three-month summer program to build your architecture portfolio. So I left Colgate, and I went to Cambridge, and I basically was there going like, I think architecture is what I want to do. I want to commit to it, and I think I'd be good at it. So Like, I have to build a portfolio. I'll go to San Francisco afterwards. I'll get a job in architecture as like a lowly, you know, drafts person intern thing. And I'll see where that's like. And I'll have some carnal knowledge of the industry. And then maybe I'll build enough work there to to get a portfolio together and like go to get a master's in architecture. Made sense. I got into like this program's kind of cool um, at Harvard. And I fell in love with it. I worked so hard. It was so cool. It was in the Carpenter Center, which is like where the actual architecture school happens during the the school year. So you felt very like you're in it, you know, at the highest level and you're surrounded by all this history. And I just worked super hard. I loved it. I built this portfolio in retrospect. It was probably, you know, shit, but 
it felt good to me. I met some great people. And then, you know, I hopped in a car with three friends and drove across the country to San Francisco. I hadn't ever been to California. So I was just like, okay, I'm going here because this is cool. And I know some people there. And it was about as far away from where I grew up as I could get in the, in the continental United States. How long did you spend on the road? Did you go, go straight yeah. to San Francisco no, no, or did I you sp- meander around? I meandered. I spent about, spent maybe a week and a half. Maybe two weeks. Okay. Yeah. We went the northern route, saw some people in Chicago, cruised around, got down to, you know, Midwest, did that, kind of went up into Wyoming and Jackson, down to Colorado, down through Arizona, LA, or San Diego, back up on the PCH, all the way to San Francisco. It was kind of all over the place, but it was fun. Yeah. I'm having a nostalgic memory of my own. You did the same? Got in a car with two friends and we spent a month on the road driving to California too. (laughs) Man, I've always wanted to do that. Oh, it's so good. So I landed 99. It was a crazy moment in San Francisco's recent technologically driven history, right? Mm -hmm. I went to like a Google launch party. No one knew what that was. (laughs) They had terrible t-shirts with terrible fonts and terrible (laughs) colors. And you're just like, what is this terribly designed thing, right? So a lot of naivete in terms of what is happening around you. Also, such an interesting moment in sort of like social societal history where you're looking at what technology is doing to a city, which I guess would sort of echo what was going to happen again more intensely. I couldn't get a job for a while, which is sort of like sad. You know, I had a bunch of friends, you know, I was like, I wanted to do this architecture experience thing. I I kept meeting with all these architecture firms. I didn't have enough. I didn't have an in, you know, Mm. and there's interns lining the streets uh, to work. So I was sort of getting a little bit frustrated. And I was like, I work really hard. I'm really good at what I just teach me. I'll be, you know, I was, I was all in you know, mentally, it was just kind of like that frustration of formality, I think, of of the architecture world and kind of like what you need. And they have a sort of endless supply of young, wide-eyed graduates to pick from. Right. They're being fed by the institutions that are feeding them yeah. graduates that have following the same protocol. Yeah, absolutely. It kind of it became obvious to me that like it was going to be hard, but I was I was still trying. But I was living with, you know, friends of friends or brothers of friends and and these people all had like these really interesting jobs with job titles I had never heard of, you know. A lot of which included digital blah 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 or, you know, interactive architect. Remember that one? Doesn't Ooh. happen anymore that much, but that was like a super hot title. Information architect or infra- interactive architect. And I heard that and I was like, "Huh, I wonder what that's about." They're using some of the words I know. Very quickly, although it sounds strange, I sort of started to meet with some people who were working at digital agencies and looking at what they do and how they think about building what was then a pretty nascent version of the web in its more modern form. And I just saw like the way I thought about architecture and space as like a sequence of experiences from outside to inside and and rooms almost with their different vibe and different information. My brain just like hooked into the digital version of that you know like i i understood a web page or an application as a series of sort of rooms that you could inhabit and the size and scale of the rooms were different and all rooms can't connect to all other rooms but they connect a lot easier in digital space and it got me super interested in that sort of aesthetic aspect of of interaction and digital Mm. space so it was like a very strange mental leap but it wasn't to me it was very close I joined a, a very small, like at the time, I think 15 people digital agency. And I went on kind of a wild little ride for like a few years. Did you seek them out? Did you start with this understanding that your brain was processing all this new information and technology in that way? Did you start thinking that you would be a good fit for places like that? and Or, or were you just kind of casting a wide net and you found a place where it seemed like it could be exciting. I was having meetings that I could get as a 21-year-old kid with no formal education in digital or design or architecture or whatever. And I was just gauging my interest and 
enjoyment of what they were doing. And I was doing a lot of like informational interviews, you know, which is code for like, you don't have to hire me, but just spend 15 minutes with me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, the bank account was running down and I needed a job, but I was also just like, look, I got to like see what this is all about. And I think this one meeting I had with the owner of this company, Total Creative at the time, who I'm still friends with, he just took a flyer, you know, he was like, oh, smart kid, needs someone who can learn quickly. You know, we're growing. We'll get them up to speed at some level. And that was it. So I have to mm. imagine at that particular point in time, too, nobody really comes into those interviews. No 21 year olds come into those interviews with a whole lot of experience because there just wasn't education to support it yet. You're absolutely right. Didn't exist. Everyone was making it up on yeah. the fly. Right. Yeah. How fun for you to be there while everybody's figuring it out like total well, wild west. Well, that's exactly it. That was the sentiment because contrast an interview like that or an interview at Razorfish or an interview at Organic. You remember all these companies or mm -hmm. March for like all like that first wave of digital mm -hmm. and contrast that vibe with like air on chairs and it's just people skateboarding around the, all the cliches, right? Of the yeah. first com, like everything, dogs and skateboards and the, and the vibe of that place. I didn't know what people were doing, but I knew in theory and contrast that with like architecture interviews, which the architecture firms I was meeting with hadn't evolved in, you know, 20 or 30 years. The practice was the same. I mean, obviously they involved, uh, evolved technically in a lot of ways, but culturally it was still the same, you know, Firms run by sort of megalomaniac leaders, often with their name on the door, and then sort of an oppressive regime of hierarchy all the way down to the intern and model maker who just, you know, sleep on the floor all day, <laughs> right? That's, yeah. that's the paradigm. It, by, by the way, it still persists, right? Yeah. And I'm pretty outspoken about architecture world. You know, just imagine like a 21-year-old kid moving to California, like what is going to like really light your fire? And so I think part of it was just like finding something that vibed right. And it was clearly like this digital thing, which took me off of that path I had thought about, but it was okay because it was actually, it, it opened several other interesting doors. And I rode the dot-com boom to mm -hmm. its peak. That's you know, like we, skateboarding in itself. <laughs> it's, it's crazy, right? I was like in it. It was like South Park, San Francisco. You know, we had our cool office. We moved to our second cool office. We fitted out another cool office. We had all the cool swag. We got bought by a big consult technology consulting firm. Everyone was super psyched. And then three months later, six months later, I remember looking outside and watching, you know, Aaron wheelie chairs being pushed out of like every office within 10 square blocks, you know, to be sold at, you know, a quarter of the price as every one of those companies downsized or closed. So like as a kid to watch, you know, the ride up and then the spectacular crash, it was like a better education than you could get anywhere else. Yeah. Talk about your economics degree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you saw it at, not at a macro level. You saw it like as a, as a human being, you know, as yeah. I learned how businesses create culture, they can destroy culture. I learned how under pressure behaviors reveal a lot about the character of people. I learned a lot about the quality of relationships you make and that keeping those relationships alive, independent of the company you're at is really critical. I learned a lot about the business case of a company, right? Like having to think about how something actually works and its value in the world, not just like a shiny new idea. So it was like a probably the best education outside of an institution I could have could have had. When you took that initial interview and you said you're still friends with your boss, the guy who interviewed you, did you feel a click, like a chemistry click? Absolutely. He was the guy who was entrepreneurial by nature. He was a startup kind of mentality guy. But he also had, you could tell he shot from his hip a little bit, right? Like he mm -hmm. would, he didn't have to do a, a thousand hours of research on you or 10 other informational interviews with your previous bosses or teachers or recommends. He just kind of felt it and he went with it. So, yeah, and I want to get into that later when we talk about your leadership at Hush because I'm wondering if you when you're hiring, if you feel that same chemistry click. But before we get there, it sounds like the crash also left you kind of trying to figure out what was next for you. And I'm wondering if that's what led you to study media design at Art Center. You're exactly right. So my boss, Doug, knew it was coming. 
Oh. And he, he actually was super cool and was like, hey, I'm going to keep you on until the end. So why don't you make some plans? And when I fire you, you can at least get some unemployment from the government and I can get you a little severance, but I'm going to give you as much time as I can to hold this ship together before it all crashes. And that wasn't something I think he gave to everybody. So it was a pretty cool gesture to basically buy myself some time to get really critical about thinking about what was going to happen with a safety net, effectively. That is cool. Super cool. I had been at that point there for long enough to know that I had a lot to contribute, but I had never had any formal education in, in design, like we talked about earlier, right? Like I, I had revolved around it. I studied art history. I kind of studied architectural history. I, kind of, I knew the world, but I didn't know it to turn it into like something I could do with my hand, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's a huge difference. I didn't yet have that rigor that you have in design school where you're a hundred studies of the same thing. You know, that kind of like muscle building. Right. And so I kind of knew that compared to the folks I had worked alongside of who were designers who had that, I would never be able to progress to a place where they were unless I had that rigor. It's much like an athlete, you know, it's like you can pick up a baseball and throw it. But if you haven't thrown it a thousand times, you know, you're not going to throw strikes. So that's kind of what I knew I needed. And I looked at a bunch of schools in San Fran and, you know, back east and everywhere. And I ended up going down to Art Center to this very interesting graduate program, which I absolutely loved. And not at the time, but in retrospect, I think represents a lot of what we do at Hush. I didn't know Hush was a manifestation of that program at Art Center, but I can connect some serious dots. What was the program? I mean, we said it's media design, but can you just elaborate on what that looks like for people who might not quite know what art school is like and the specifics of a media design curriculum? Yeah. And, and again, that's the nomenclature from those years, right? I don't mm -hmm. even think that's the nomenclature of the program now because it, media design is like everything and nothing. Uh, mm -hmm. Very similar to experience <laughs> design. It's like, uh, what? <laughs> experience. Okay. So tell me when that starts and stops. Um, <laughs> yeah. So basically, you know, in, in just colloquial sort of layman's terms, it's it was a confluence of a kind of like, I would say, aesthetic, graphic, semiotic design practice, right? So like people with the graphic design branding kind of experience mixed with a big technology play. So like really understand digital, really understand technical systems and hardware and like robotics and like product and weird digital to physical computing that kind of vibe. Mm -hmm. And then there was a big entrepreneurship sort of business rationale um, ingredient too, right? So everything was about, you know, using design in those two ways to support either on, like business entrepreneurship or social good and entrepreneurship. So like coming up with really interesting ideas for products, services, or companies that can help the world or help the pocketbook using those kind of design tools. So those are like the three core uh, circles of the Venn diagram. But as a graduate student, we had access to everything at the undergrad level at Art Center. So I jumped back into like the scary design 101 courses where you're getting your work like torn off the wall you know, after as, after you've been up all night doing like a hundred <laughs> iterations of like, put, you know, this piece of type in a white box like a thousand times and see what it does to the composition, you know? So I was like getting this simultaneous, like amazing rigor or film school, you know, like shoot 15 short films in the next like 16 weeks, you know, and you learn like how to tell a stupid story, you know, from start to finish and edit. And, and so I was doing all this like really low level, I would say like, you know, early level design work. But then I would go in the graduate classes and have to like really think much more strategically, much more high end in terms of just like making sense of something. It sounds so exciting and also humbling. Did you find it humbling? Oh, God. I, I remember the first design class I had was with the professor, Denise Gonzalez-Crisp. She was like an amazing typographer and just designed 
person and just super, super cool. She actually invited me down to NC State to speak with her students a, a year or two ago, and it was wonderful to see her again. And she scared the shit out of me the first day. <laughs> I mean, I was so unprepared with my just ability to even do the stupid little exercises that she was assigning. It was one of those instances where you, you felt like a fake, you know? You mm-hmm. felt like you had I had gotten there by sort of faking my way in with enough knowledge to sound smart, enough portfolio to look like, okay, maybe there's something there. But when it came down to like just the brass tacks of a design assignment, you know, like interpret this theme or idea within this medium, you have 24 hours kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I just, it was like being handcuffed. It was so frustrating. It was like being in a foreign country and not knowing the language. And like, you just, you just want to get something done. You just want to get your dry cleaning done and you can't even get it done because you don't speak the language. And it was just like, I vowed from that moment. I was like, I'm going to just destroy all these other classes so I can come back to this class <laughs> and be able to be on at least, uh, be at least a peer with the other folks there. So it was humbling but humbling mm-hmm. made me feel super motivated. Mm-hmm. And I slept on the floor of that school a lot. And it was just <laughs> awesome. It was just awesome. I would, I would do it again in a heartbeat. Like I loved every minute. Like uh, that was a formative few years for me. Absolutely. Like it absolutely changed my life without any um, exaggeration. Wow. I think the grad school experience was similar for me in that I had figured out what I wanted to study and I had spent a couple years in the workforce. So I kind of knew like going back to grad school was a very conscious decision. And I always say like I I grew like 50 years and aged 10 years in in two (laughs) years. But it was the most amazing, like nutrient dense, concentrated growth and like I crave that. I miss it. I crave it. It was amazing. Is that because you think you kind of had an ability to kind of write your own script? You were focused on what you wanted to achieve out of it? Like you had more your hands on the wheel? Absolutely. My yeah. hands were on the wheel. I was I was commandeering the vehicle and driving it where I wanted it to go. And I was soaking up all the information that I needed to get where I wanted to go. It was awesome. And all the facilities and and faculty at your disposal, right? I mean, just having that at your fingertips was awesome. Yeah, I used to say that Art Center, the old campus or whatever, the modern campus on this beautiful hilltop outside of Pasadena, it's kind of like a fishbowl, so lots of glass. And Mm -hmm. all you have to do to be motivated or scared is walk from one end of the building to the other because the caliber of talent there, at least in the making, I think it's kind of criticized a little bit as like a wrist school, but the caliber of making there is just so high. I would walk by these labs where kids were working on, and I would just look at what was on their screen. And I was like, I don't know what that is, (laughs) but I want to figure out how to do that because that's just so beautiful or interesting or, uh, you know, whatever. So it's very humbling, like every turn. We've got to take a break, but we'll be right back after this message. Support for Clever comes from Abstract, design workflow management for digital design teams using Sketch. Spend less time searching for design files and tracking down feedback, and more time focusing on innovation and collaboration. Like GitHub, but for designers, Abstract is your team's version-controlled source of truth for digital design work. With Abstract, you can version design files, present work, request reviews, collect feedback, and give developers direct access to all specs, all from one place. Head to GoAbstract.com to sign your team up for a free 30-day trial. And Abstract is offering a chance to win a $500 credit to their business plan. All you have to do is tweet at GoAbstract and mention you heard about it on Clever to be entered to win. So I want to connect the dots to Hush. How did you go from your MFA at Art Center to founding Hush Studios? I basically outworked and faked my way into it. Um, (laughs) Can you see there's a theme there? Um, I'm like never prepared enough to what I have to do. I'm just 
pushing with a kind of confidence and know that like if there's enough smart people around me, we'll we will get there. So for me, are you actually not prepared enough, or do you just have this like arbitrary idea of what really prepared people are like, and you you've decided that you're not <laughs> measuring up to that? <laughs> well, I'm prepared for the things I have to prepare for. I just mean like in life. You know, I don't think there's like a level you get to where it's like, oh, now you figured it out and now I'm right. ready to take on this thing, right? Like it happens every day at work, you know, I'll sit in a meeting with a potential new client and they'll be talking about things and I'll be thinking, wow, we're really good at a lot of that stuff. But there's a few things they're talking about that like we are not experts on, like, <laughs> uh, but we're going to do this and we're going to become experts at that. And and it's like tearing muscle. It's like, I feel like we just get stronger and stronger. So that's just a general attitude. But from Art Center to Hush is is not that complicated a jump. It's not even that complicated as a like a LinkedIn, you know, bullet point trajectory. I had my grad thesis show at Art Center, which consisted of like a pile of televisions with a bunch of like film and animation and motion graphics things I made on it, which was interesting to me because I made a film at the end of Art Center, which is like so kind of superficial and kind of laughable in retrospect. But I decided, right, to put it on like a pile of screens at all different scales and sizes, which is a cliche art installation, you know, video art installation trope anyway. But it was showing that I wasn't happy with the 16 by 9 rectangle, or at the time it was like a 4 by 3 rectangle. I wasn't happy with just what was in the frame two-dimensionally. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see things be and take up more space and be seen from different angles and different perceptions. And so I, that's actually really interesting to think back about why I wasn't happy just like putting mm -hmm. up a projection or something and being like this sort of thing. In that grad show, this guy Kyle Cooper was there. Kyle Cooper was a guy who ran a company called Prologue. He started a company called Imaginary Forces. He was also the guy who revolutionized film titles he did the seven film titles and like a million other film titles anyway kind of a, a very famous personality in the design and film world uh, in la especially and he saw he's like hey you want to come work for me and i'm like uh, of course like you know he he's kind of like a legend in that way and so that was the scariest thing I ever did for a few months at his um, at his studio when I got out of school. I also slept on the floor there quite a bit, also because I wasn't good enough with the tools compared to everyone else there. But we just worked like 18 hours a day, every day, incessantly. He was in his pajamas, you know, in the edit suite. He slept on the couch next to us, got up from his house, came back. You know, it was intense and scary. So that kind of propelled me into the the freelance world of just design and, and storytelling and whatever, but it still wasn't what we do at Hush. And then I was brought into a bunch of sort of interactive studios that people also who kind of trusted me, kind of funny theme, right? Like I wasn't the best designer, but I was pretty good with clients. I could articulate design and its value really well. And so I was often, even very young, kind of put at the front of projects, you know? Yeah, I was able to position the work and build some confidence in the work with, with folks. So that was cool. And Sounds like you're good at symphonic thinking. Symphonic thinking. I've never called it that, but I think so. Yeah, yeah. Just, you can see all the instruments, how they need to play, when they need to come in, how to communicate that. I actually think that's very, that comes really naturally to me. That sort of gets into later, like how we, how like our process at Hush and how we show up in teams and sort of that kind of stuff. But, but yes, I was, I was good at juggling a lot of pieces of the puzzle and understanding sort of empathetically what our clients needed and sort of we were, we were at and what our teams needed and, and, and rolling up my sleeves and doing the, doing the work. But it was still apparent that next to amazing other art center graduates sitting next to me, I, you know, they were, innately more talented at the making than I was. So, you know, it's just a kind of self-realization. But I made a lot too. I think I made some pretty cool stuff. So I bounced a lot around between LA, Chicago, and New York, like freelancing as a graphic designer, as a motion designer, as a filmmaker, doing interactive art direction. And it was super fun. Like I could make a living. I could live in different places. I could get a, an apartment for a few weeks, you know. And Eventually, I made my way back to New York for a lot of reasons, mostly my now wife. 
we ended up getting together, moving to Buenos Aires for six months to mess around and then moving to New York. Oh, fun. That sounds like a fun adventure. Yeah, super fun. <laughs> the hush thing is like, I met my business partner working at a firm called Brand New School, which is still a great design, animation, motion, film, commercial filmmaking company. Now they do some interactive as well. And we were just given a lot of room to run and we sort of took it and we cut our teeth on a lot of big things. We were down in Buenos Aires of all places, you know, shooting for months at a time with 300 extras and giant crews. And, you know, we had a lot of autonomy, even though we absolutely shouldn't have had it. Mm. Uh, <laughs> Um, That's so fun. Yeah, so fun. And for whatever reason, the owner of the company who at the time was, you know, or still is, but at the time was a few, you know, maybe like four years older than we were, was just somehow, you know, trusted us to do, to do right and to do well. And so in that experience, my partner and I showed our true colors to each other in a way and realized pretty soon that we were on the same page in our careers and we were like we don't want to do this for someone else especially someone else who's like four years older than us like what are we going to do you know work our way up the ladder like this guy's he's like right there we need our own ladder you know we need our own uh, space so we were we were kind of mentally on the same page for for trying to start something new and we were so goddamn naive it wasn't even funny like man i think that's the only way you can do it yep Honestly, because when, once you start really like knowing everything that's involved, aka being prepared, aka maybe even being jaded, it's too overwhelming. You can't do it. Naivete is such an asset when it comes to starting new stuff. <laughs> it is. If you knew all the complications and risk and stress and nuances of like how to run a small studio, you would probably just bail before you even started <laughs> so we we were naive enough to think that we could do everything these other companies could do but we were maybe prepared just enough that we you know we we, we could we could actually start a business and maybe start making some money sooner than later so you founded hush what year was that 2006 2007 Okay, so you've been doing this for quite a while. So obviously, yeah. you weren't na na too naive to fail, right? So, oh, we came. We've come pretty close. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I'm interested in what Hush does, and then like, what's your creative process for these interactive projects that you do? Because I'm semi creative, but like, I have a hard time wrapping my brain around like how one of these installations comes to fruition. Can you kind of give us maybe an example or is there something that you do with every project that, you know, is, is helpful for you in getting from A to B? Just to lay the foundation, we started Hush knowing that like we wanted to inject space and technology into the commercial world. And at the time, there's still architects at the time, there's still event makers at the time, you know, like this stuff isn't like new right it just wasn't called what it was called we just were like hey we're like we're pretty technically savvy we know how to design we know interfaces we know motion we know how to tell a good story i had this like architectural background my partner had a lot of like 3d backgrounds so we all thought in like three-dimensional space and we were like we got to put this all together and it wasn't i absolutely promise you it wasn't written in the business plan what we're doing today but the the dna or like the ingredients were there and it just took us uh, several years to figure out that like this is the special sauce and when we put these things together in a right way you actually get a lot of value and it answers something in the marketplace that like no one was really doing that well you know and so we were able to start thinking about installations or space and brand and companies wanting to express themselves or their ideas wanting to teach people something or motivate something and we could kind of activate spaces in a way that was kind of new, kind of interesting and kind of created just, just different experiences for people to have that weren't, that weren't happening uh, already. And we found this little sort of area between the practices of architecture design, which I'm is like kind of flat thinking, you know, graphics, mm -hmm. environmental graphics, two dimensional design and technology. And each of those, buckets have like their own entire industry right architecture has been going on in this formal 
very commercial practice for a long time. It was very refined in how it's done. Technology is always changing, but the technological industry is about coming up with cool new products that are bigger, better, faster, cooler, you know, whatever. And then design has this sort of legacy of formalism and, and history and style that keeps changing. It wasn't bending to apply to this technological force and architectural force in the way we wanted it to. So that was like what we were ping-ponging around doing for years and years and trying to figure out how it actually comes to, to life. And, and I think that sort of demonstrates how we think about what we do with the knowledge of the forces at work on a project like this, right? Mm -hmm. So we build teams to match that. So like right now I'm looking out on a bunch of people who have more formal graphic design educations, interactive design backgrounds. I'm looking at a bunch of architectural people who don't want to practice architecture in the pure way. I'm looking at technologists, right? So it's not rocket science. Those brains are just looking at the same challenge through different lenses or histories or, or sort of educations, you know. And how do you harness all those brains together to make what you need to make? Any sort of semblance of process that we've built over a decade sort of started to be destroyed when we started to work for big tech companies. And here's why. The One of our clients at Uber told me first when we started working with them, hey, like, by the time you do your, like, phase one of design – with like all your strategy and your, you know, initial comps and your moods and your, you know, refined this, that, that we'll have changed our business model or have invented like two or three new product lines. So the rate at which your design process is taking off, right? The, the, the speed at which you are being able to deliver isn't consistent with the speed of, of sort of Silicon Valley and technology development which was oh, really, really, that's really crazy. interesting. And as a designer, like finally like a trained designer who like understands process and refinement and perfection, it's hard sometimes to think about the companies that are kind of touting the mottos of like, you know, move fast, break things or done is better than perfect, right? Um, mm. those, those kind of philosophies sort of like feel antithetical to, to the kinds of things we want to make, right? Because as any kind of designer, you want your craft to be crafted and you want to have it be high quality and you want it to have some kind of permanence. But the rate of change of, of a lot of companies we work with is just so fast. It's almost like that's not the same value system anymore. I'm wondering like as as a leader of these projects, how do you keep your team, I guess, all running at the same speed? Yeah. That goes into process, right? Like, it's not like we're always sprinting because that would be it's not sustainable. Right. Okay. I think Thank God. I was. Th it sounded like you were always sprinting. No. In fact, I think over time, we've slowed down the company, which ah. sounds weird. Like, I feel like we work less total hours than I used to do in the first, you know, half of this company. I certainly do. I think that like sweaty, crazy sprint mentality, we don't have any more that much because we've sort of refined the way we think and how we, how we work. Now, how do, how do we like slow down, but also speed up by the client demands? It's less about sustained speed. It's about when to sprint and when not to, mm. right? It's like, you need to make the bed, you know, you need to lay your ingredients out. You need to get the information from even companies and clients moving at the speed of light and you need to sort of absorb it and deeply get into it or else you're never going to do good work. That's just reality. It's really, it's like about when you really increase that curve and when you kind of get, get going, you can't just start running as fast as you can. Or you, just go, you just go in the wrong direction. So yeah, it's it's been like a tuning, you know? It's been like, how do we use our, our history of like working now? We've done hundreds of projects, you know? We have a lot of, of experience to bring to the table. So how do we create a framework that people can tap into, freelancers can tap into, new hires can tap into, that we all have as like kind of like a Bible, but not be so rigorous and inflexible that we can't pivot or uh, improvise, you know? So someone who worked here talked about uh, it has jazz, you know, everyone playing jazz, like you're, you're all to the same time 
and you're sunk in terms of how you're the beats and you're, and you're sunk into how you're playing, but each of you have this like improvisational section. And so between these two points in time, you can kind of go off and do whatever you want, but you end up landing back at the same point in time and you're back with the rest of the rest of the band. And I think it's kind of like that. Like we have milestones and ways we start the way we progress and the way we finish, but in between we're able to add this sort of like improvisational piece just to tune it to, to how our clients like working. I love that you said that. We had another guest on Clever, Eric Quint, mm-hmm. who's the chief design officer of 3M. Mm-hmm. And he also talked about leading a team like being part of improvisational jazz. Mm. Like there's a band leader, sure, but you're not prescribing what they're going to do. In fact, you want to get the best from every person and their expression and their instrument and their technical prowess and their creative thinking. And so to do that, you... You got to think of it like jazz and you got to be okay with the collaborative improvisation that happens yeah. and just know if it sounds good or not. <laughs> yeah. And like, you know, everyone talks about like happy accidents and things like you can't be so rigorous that like you can't see new things that arise. Like you can't be so precious that your process is so dogmatic that like, yeah, hey, that's, that's a cool thing, but it's not within our process or that's a cool thing, but we have this deliverable on Friday and if we go that way, we're never going to make it. It's like... And that comes a lot to like client relationships, right? Like if you have a good, trusted client relationship, you're articulating this along the way, right? You're like, hey, I know we have this thing, but look at what we found over here. Look at what we made. We never knew that we would get here, but we found this amazing thing. I don't think we should overlook that, this. Mm -hmm. And then like, and readjusting. And so that kind of like agile model is also like a, a part of the project. Now, the problem is like agile thinking in in its broad sense as well as agile literally with a capital a of like software development is a great thing in software it's a terrible thing in the built environment so oh, so we'll, don't i know it yeah as somebody who builds physical things right <laughs> so you can't cut a board and make it bigger that's I, now that's <laughs> i'm gonna steal that one that's a good one <laughs> I think a lot of our value in the room for the projects we do is like helping to mediate between these forces. You have a group of people who are like literally pouring concrete, you know, in the middle of like Manhattan and that Mm -hmm. concrete is curing and the scaffolding is going up and they can't uncure it, you know? Right. And then you have a lot of people who are thinking about content and messaging and the strategy of brand and digital applications and how people use them in spaces and what they afford and information and what people can see and do. And for the the people who trade in concrete and steel, these conversations seem almost superfluous as well as something they can deal with later. And for us, we're, we're the sort of go-between that helps everyone understand that Certain things are a one-way street and certain things can be spun around in circles for a long time. But if they're not interlacing and talking to each other, like it's like a super fail. That's when you get like giant billboards on the side of buildings that like have a spinning logo on it. Like that's that's what happens when those two forces aren't talking to each other. Mm -hmm. It's also the equivalent of painting yourself into a corner. That's right. If you go down one of those one-way one streets, you, you start to limit your options in a way that really compromises the, the end result. Absolutely. And we always say, if you look at like an architectural plan, a painting, right, mm-hmm. on a wall is indicated by like a, a little very thin rural line, right? The mm-hmm. same scale digital surface, whether it could be projections or some beautiful digital sculpture or some big led wall or something like that is indicated by a similar gesture but one has a very different effect than the other and so what happens in the architectural world is that they read the effect the same and Mm. and as anyone who's ever been next to like a wall of led screens you know you don't want to be anywhere near that wall as a human being with five senses but right. a beautiful painting, you could stare <laughs> at it up close, a right? seizure in the making. That's right. <laughs> so we exist to design the content, the container of that content, and the impacts on the architectural space and materiality all with the same hand and make sure they're put together as a sandwich that makes sense and is compelling and often beautiful. Our, our, I think our work is, it's about as artistic as you can get without being commissioned artwork. Mm. 
So you talked a little bit about company culture and also some of the experiences that you had working for the interactive tech digital companies. Um, and you saw a lot of what went on, what was positive and what was negative. And I assumed you brought all of your learnings with you when you co-founded Hush. I'm interested to know what kind of leadership style that you have. You talked a little bit about it being like jazz, but I'm interested to know, like, how do you inspire your team to be their best? And what are some of the specific company cultural things that you've applied to your culture? And what are you trying to shy away from that you found out didn't work at your previous places? That question is what I probably spend 50% of my time on in my current role at the company. Trying to think about this like petri dish we've created and what ingredients we're going to put into it to make everyone happy motivated and and successful at their job and i actually think that's i'm fascinated by it like i'm still mm -hmm. super into the work i don't have my fingers in the pixels and the details and the material finishes and things in the same way i'm still involved conceptually and i love working with the teams that way but like for me like the projects are cool things and they have value and they go into a nice portfolio and that's gratifying. But the ultimate project for me, like is the company, like it's its own creative thing, you know, that I think about as a, as a creative opportunity as its own creative project. And, and I think like all those like human factors and cultural values and behaviors are the things that I'm super obsessed with. And to cut to the point, I learned a lot, when I was in San Francisco, bad and good. I learned a lot at the many other companies I freelanced for because I thought that was one of the awesome values of being a freelancer is like you get to like go to other people's homes and like see how you're treated and what's it like when you arrive and do you celebrate my birthday too when I'm a freelancer and I'm not staff? Like, do I get mm -hmm. to go to that meeting but not that meeting because I'm like an outsider? Or do you welcome me or am I just like a risk to do something for a month or two? And so I, I picked up like all this information. It was like, it was like something I could never get now, right? I could, I could see into all these companies and just see their cultures and behaviors. And I could kind of take what I thought was really valuable and what we wanted to recreate. So it sounds simple, but like we fucked up our culture so many times, so many times at various points along the company's development. And that's just like how you learn. You know, you, you, you think you have culture because people like, like coming to work every day and like they're fun and there's like music playing and there's like, everyone's cool and fun and they're going out to lunch and we're doing cool stuff. And we're staying there late, jamming on the work. And you think that's culture, but that's not culture. That's just, that's just like a vibe or something like mm. culture is actually like decisions you make, not what happens mm -hmm. to you, you know? And for a long time, we thought that culture was good if people were just like, having a good time at work but it just became clear that culture was things that we had to really make very 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 overt and very clear and like hire by it live by it work with clients who abide by the same kind of rules and and constantly constantly talk about it or it becomes commandeered by the people that necessarily you don't want to have leading that part I worked for a digital agency, you know, and you went through this with the tech boom, where you go into these offices, and there's like, pool table or ping pong table, and you have beer Fridays and pizza Thursdays. And it's all of these things that you think is company culture. But then like you work 15 hour days, you know, you're there at 6am, there's people sleeping on the floor, you're exhausted. And like, everything's about deadlines. And then you realize like your company doesn't value you as a human being, right? Um, even though they offer you all these perks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then right. I started like looking for jobs at companies that didn't have perks, because then I knew that like, they actually <laughs> like cared about the employees and didn't just want to like bait us with like fun things to do, because now we're stuck at the office for 15 hours. Right. Wasn't that the ultimate trick? Like perks so aren't fun perk, to work here. Right. Perks aren't culture, right? It, they are a subset sometimes if they come out of like a desire to, to have a balanced work experience, like that makes sense. But often it's just a thing. My favorite work experiences have always been those where I'm working with people who 
no matter what I'm hired for, I may be hired for, let's say, a specific role or a specific skill, but no matter what that is, they start to recognize what I'm really good at and how my analytical mind and creative mind work together, and they start to use it and apply me in ways that make me feel like I have some ownership and I have some responsibility in solving these problems, and that I get to apply myself in my best possible way, and then I feel like... Mm -hmm. This is a really satisfying work experience, no matter if there are like company perks or benefits. It's I get to participate in a way that makes me feel like I'm doing my best work. Yeah, which is the culture of opportunity, right? The culture mm-hmm. of autonomy in some ways. I think, you know, it, it'd be nice if you had a, you know, a beer Friday every now and again, but ultimately like the opportunity to do what you are clearly love doing and feel good about doing and have chosen as a life path is sort of like the ultimate perk and the ultimate culture definer, you know? Yeah. So speaking of the ultimate perk and the ultimate culture definer, we're all three-dimensional, full-spectrum human beings, and work is one aspect of our lives. I think we're all kind of the same in that our work is our life and our purpose and are a big part of why we like waking up in the morning. But How do you keep yourself from burning out when the pace is so lightning fast and the projects are all different each time? I mean, in many ways, a different project each time can be exactly what keeps you from burning out because you're constantly learning. But do you ever just feel worn out from the treadmill of technology? Now we're getting deep. Now we're going deep. And if you can figure it out on this interview, I can save myself a lot of money. All right. (laughs) I feel like one of the best parts of our culture is that smart, good, hardworking people who respect the values of the company get a lot of opportunity. There's no... There's no ceiling and there's no ego as you know, as far as I can really tell involved. And I derive, as well as my partner, derives like true pleasure, true endorphin rushes from seeing other people do awesome without our involvement or with our support or whatever. You know, I, I really know that that happens in my body when I see that happen. I'm like so proud of everyone. So I love that. But this company is definitely like an extension of me and my skills and my kind of brain and kind of how I see the world and sort of my attitude. And it's grown close, you know, I've grown close to it and it's grown close to me over time. And so there's this very strange and potentially unhealthy relationship, right, between the company and myself as a person, right? And so the idea of like leaving that at work and going home, you know, or shutting it off when I walk out the door is very hard, Mm -hmm. you know? And even if you do it formally, like shutting the door or shutting off the phone or, you know what I mean? These are like formal things you can do to just kind of like cut off communication or move on and get back into family or personal. Your mind is its own mind, right? So I feel like there's a lot of blur between the two things, which to get to your question is incredibly exhausting and it's not about hours because it's not it's not that i'm working 15 hour days all the time it's about carrying the mental stress and the possibility and um, working out problems and the puzzle game that is you know a design company it's like it's always happening right so it's always going on yeah it's the mental heavy lifting and and emotional heavy lifting of making key decisions and being the captain charting the course and navigating and reading the weather and all of that at the same time. I think that's why I asked this question is I'm trying to figure out how do people manage? I mean, it's funny that we're having this interview. I I think in the last two years, this question has become more front and center in my life than it's ever been, right? Like I've always said I can outwork anybody. And I think that's always been the case, right? Like I was the kid on the athletic field, like sprinting harder than everyone else, right? I was like like that. And it was like like a hunting dog will kind of like hunt until it's dead, you know? Mm-hmm. I kind of have that DNA and it's it's a problem because mm-hmm. you can just go, go, go until you have nothing left. And so the last couple of years and obviously like having kids and, and my family and it challenges your behaviors in different ways and and what you want to do and what's healthy and all that stuff. So I don't know. 
how do you deal hiring very smart, very talented, very trustworthy people and, and just giving them the room to run did a lot, right? It did a lot for the company. It took a lot off my mind and it, it made me feel good in every way. So I think that's that continues to be a strategy. But also like thinking bigger, right? Thinking beyond hush, thinking about what else I can do and what my purpose is in, in the world is really important to me. I'm not looking to graduate out of hush. I'm just looking to see like what's the bigger idea here, which has been awesome to spend time on because once you build that bigger idea, hush becomes but one thing to plug into, right? I think my big purpose is sort of to create spaces for people to be their most creative, right? So it's like, I don't mean spaces literally in the physical form. I mean, like create the opportunity for people to be creative and successful. And so if you look at that as hush, as a particular manifestation, it makes a lot of sense. Right. But like, mm-hmm. um, I've really enjoyed mentoring at the new museums incubator program, uh, called new Inc. So I get to work with these amazingly talented inventors, innovators, you know, designers, technologists, and I help them like, think about what they want to achieve and I kind of give them some guardrails and some coaching and I just work through a lot of stuff with them. And so that's the same manifestation of that purpose, I think. I think that has legs and it creates a little bit of healthy distance from the company and it sort of fuels and satisfies other parts of my my brain. Yeah, thank you for for saying that. And as you're telling me this story, thinking about something bigger your bigger purpose. It reminds me of the a wonderful feeling I feel both on the ocean and on the desert is that those things are so vast that I feel small, but small in a good way, not small in an insignificant way, but small in a way that kind of puts things in perspective. And I do think that's really helpful what you just shared with us, like being able to zoom out and really get a healthy magnitude of perspective can make you feel more comfortable with the overwhelmingness of it all. Yeah, or that you you have value for other things, right? Like yeah. when, you are, when you've been doing something for so long and you spend literally most of your waking hours doing it, if you just really do the math, right? Think about how much time mm-hmm. we spend with, with my, my peers at work versus my kids or my wife, like it's just, or my friends, it's just crazy. So you, you are literally spending an inordinate amount of hours in this place. And so you're naturally going to sort of digest it and be more intimate with it and, and think that this is the only thing you have to think about. Um, but, but remembering that there's like so much out there and so much tangential things to do and look at and be part of and participate in that also could, you know, that I can gain knowledge and just good feeling from, but also I can give a lot to, it is sort of what I've been focusing on for the past couple of years. And it's really positive. So I'm, I'm hopeful. Do you ever think about legacy? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm young enough where, and fit enough where I feel like I don't know if I'm going to be handing the keys over anytime soon, but like, I definitely think a lot about what I want to be remembered for, you know? I think Jamie and I are kind of, we're really interested in this question and we're interested in what you have to say, but we're also interested in A, how different creators and creatives think about legacy and B, whether there might be a gender difference, Mm -hmm. whether women don't think about legacy as much as men. I don't know. That's interesting. Have you seen the data skewed in any way based on asking this question? Not yet, because it's a new thing that we're that we're exploring. We sort of found a little bit of the data skewing towards males think about it more than females, but it's not conclusive. Mm-hmm. But that being said, I mean, you're not just a data point. We really do want to know if you think about legacy and how it affects the way you conduct your life. Yeah. And is it tied directly to your work or is it more of a personal thing? What's interesting is I think if you would have asked me that several years ago, I would have really thought about it in the context of work. Like, what are we putting out into the world and what's, you know, what have we made and is that cool? Does it stand up, you know, in time? Does it have longevity? Will it be remembered as like something that broke some boundaries and and did some new things? And I think I would have been more like work and portfolio focused. Um, Mm Mm-hmm. But what's happened to me over time is that the the sort of endorphin rush I get from delivering a great project that 
is good and beautiful and powerful and, and, and makes a lot of sense is shorter. And it's shorter every project. Even though the projects are getting better, bigger, more interesting, the endorphin hit of them is shrinking, which tells me something that I'm deriving the value and emotional sort of value from the company more than the project to project, right? Legacy now kind of to means like, what will Hush be remembered for? But more than that, what will the people who worked here say about their experience working here and how it changed their careers or their personal life or their ability to see differently? And I think a lot about the few key opportunities I got when I was first starting out. And I wonder and hope that the, some of the folks here will have well, like we'll tell that story as well, right? They'll be like, oh, I got a job at this crazy company and I just got thrown in the mix and I learned this and that and then I got a thing here and, and it'll be their springboard too. And that kind of mm-hmm. that kind of means a lot to me. So I, I kind of probably spend a lot of too much time thinking about if we're doing that or not for, for everyone here, but I think it's a good goal. It sounds like the instinct of somebody who's got a real mentor muscle and a real desire to be a good creative dad. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned at the beginning of this interview that you don't really look back very much. You look to the future. Yeah. That's your natural direction of your gaze. So what is the biggest goal or scenario that you can envision for for Hush? Like maybe even way off in the intergalactic future. (laughs) I think I can do like near future, near to mid future is probably fair. (laughs) Uh, Okay. (laughs) So what I think is beautiful about Hush, and I don't want anyone listening to this podcast to think that we had our shit together or knew exactly what we were meant to do in the world or we've been tracking against the business model and things over every year and it is absolutely like a retrospective right it's like you you connect dots after the fact and you make sense out of it in fact i always hated when i would go to see a lecture or something of like someone i really admired in the industry or out and they would act as if their career path was like destined or they had had mm. it figured out and they don't <laughs> acknowledge that that's just basically impossible. They probably had, they probably were motivated and made some smart decisions, but they also probably the beneficiary of lots of luck and some randomness. And I think in retrospect, people try to tell like too clean a story. So I want to say on the mm. record, story is not clean. It's just, it's, this is how it happened. But I think over time, we were able to take the core things that we loved about just design work and, and subject matter and sort of grow how we apply them in scale, right? So the first thing we ever did was the size of a table. This, you know, the 10th thing we did was the size of a room. The 30th thing we did was the size of a, of a football field. The 50th thing we did was the size of a, you know, a, a three story tall building. Um, and so on and so forth. And I think we're at the cusp of urban scale, which I think is really cool, right? It's like we've scaled this core idea and core way of seeing the world through these lenses of design. And we've applied them to bigger and bigger and bigger challenges. And I think we're right about there where we're actually looking at like urban context, like the size of a city neighborhood in the lens of experience design and how like digital and aesthetics and form and materials all come together. And I think, so for the near future, I think really starting to get into what that means and where our voice can be heard in those conversations is sort of a good focus. And then a little farther down the line, I think we are are looking to like, you know, not just be in a service business, right? The service business is wonderful and interesting and, throws new things at you all the time but at the end of the day you're paid for the hours you spend working and i think at this point we have a lot of knowledge to share and i think that can come to the table in in some other ways than just purely like great give me that knowledge for three hours and then i hear you like you want some ownership ownership or just different ways to package up our ideas and different ways for us to be valued for those ideas right like it's hard to just be smart brains for the hours that you're, you know, paid for. I think we have more to offer, more systems, more ideas, more product, more, more build it and see if they will come kind of ideas in the cooker that I think could just 
be a, a really wonderful path to explore as well in the in the coming years. So I'd love to give you an opportunity to talk about something that's coming up, a new project that you might want our listeners to know about. Sure. You know, a lot of our stuff is tightly wrapped um, until it's unwrapped. So I can kind of be a little bit tippy toe. We just launched some great stuff for LinkedIn at their campus out in Sunnyvale, some really interesting digital experiences that are just cool and fun. And hopefully those will be out in the airwaves soon. We're just getting into work with some large real estate developers here in New York to look at basically the future of one of the most trafficked and visible sites in all of Manhattan. So we're kind of starting to check some boxes that I just talked about in terms of looking at how like 800,000 people a day might experience some of our work. And that could be coming online this year. And, and that's kind of it. I think those are two, two things at two different scales that people will likely see within the next 12 months. Awesome. Where is the best place to keep tabs on all of this stuff so that we can see it as soon as it does become open for public consumption? We're pretty good about updating our site heyhush.com, H-U-I-H-U-S-H.com. But on Instagram is probably our best medium for you just to see the latest, greatest and experiments and that kind of stuff. So Hush's Instagram is official Hush Studios. Well, David, this has been like incredibly candid. I really appreciate you sharing the messy parts and the, the challenging parts along with all the triumphs and sort of the the nitty gritty of how it all came together. And it's also been really fascinating. And thank you for being somebody who cares so much <laughs> about what you're putting out into the world. Thank you for having me. You guys are great. I love this. It's just, uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. I think your work is really, really fascinating. So I was very excited to speak with you. Great, guys. I, I, I thank, thank you a lot. Thanks for listening. To see images of David's work and read the show notes, click the link in the details of this episode on your podcast app or go to cleverpodcast.com where you can also sign up for our newsletter. Subscribe to Clever on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And please, if you would do us a favor and rate and review us, it would be a really wonderful thing. We would very much appreciate it. It really does help. And also, we love it when you hit us up on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. You can find us at Clever Podcast. When you tell us your thoughts and feelings about the episode, it makes our day for reals. Clever is created, produced, and hosted by us, Amy Devers and Jamie Derringer, also known as 2VDE Media, with editing by Jenny Josephson and Rich Strafalino, and music by L1011. Clever is proudly distributed by Design Milk. <laughs>